I was at the station and uh, I was doing some paperwork and uh, a gentleman walked in and he was requesting a supervisor. Brian Heisler said that his main concern was where his sister was. Brian said a day or two earlier, he'd gotten a phone call from Phil and said that Roberta had passed away in Memphis, Tennessee, about 750 miles from Hartville, Ohio. Philip told him that Roberta had passed away in the vehicle, and two EMS personnel took her body and said that they were going to take her to the coroner's office. And then Philip left and came home without Roberta's body. So Brian was definitely very upset and just wondering what happened. Our decision was to interview him at his home so he would feel more comfortable. My goal was to get him to open up and explain what happened to his wife. So um, I wanted to act like I didn't know that she was missing. Are you, are you Phil? Yeah. Do you mind if I step in for a second? Sure, good morning. How you doing? Doing good. Good. Hey, uh, we had some calls from family members and they just wanted us to come out and check and make sure you're oh, okay yeah. on your, you and your wife. You guys okay? Well, I'm okay, yes. Okay. My Ooh. wife passed away. Okay, when that happened? The 6th. The 6th of yeah. January? Yeah. We went down to Memphis to see Elvis's down there, and she choked on, on her phlegm. She kept, she'd been choking for quite a, about a year. Okay. And, and she wanted to go down one more time before she died. She thought, I think she knew she was going to die. Okay. What, so this happened down in Memphis yeah, then? Yeah. So she was choking on her phlegm and there was an ambulance I, or? Well, these guys were there and they was checking on someone and they didn't need any help. And I said, can you help me? My wife is having a very bad problem. And they said, she, they told, said she was gone. Okay. She passed away. Where did they transport her to? I'm not sure where. During that interview, there was an uneasy feeling because I know if that was me, I would definitely not be home when my wife's body is somewhere else. So where's your wife now? What happened to her? They took her to a place where they cremate people. Okay, and you don't know where that yeah, is either? No. They, they said I could, I didn't need to stay. I could, if I wanted to, I could just go ahead and go home. Even though I spoke with him, he still wasn't giving a lot of answers to help us find Roberta. And in this day and age, you can't just drop a body off with some paramedics who are down in Memphis, Tennessee, and not know where they took her or what they did with her. I contacted the coroner, contacted uh, multiple EMS agencies, multiple hospitals in the general area, and there was nothing matching that name or description of Roberta. I thought the plot was thickening, and it was definitely getting weirder by the second. At this point, I believe that there might be some foul play involved. I was interviewing a couple people for positions in my police department, and Joan Bauer is a rock star police officer, and uh, we hired her. I talked to the chief about this case because it was all over the news. I asked him, hey, can I take a crack at this? You know, undercover, that is my background. The chief was like, yeah, let's give it a crack. They showed me a picture of him, but I did not read any police reports so I could develop the undercover person that I needed to be without being biased. 
I started doing surveillance and he made it pretty easy for me to get a pattern very quickly. On Waterloo Road. Are you gonna go to the wire right now? Yeah, yeah. She does, but she doesn't use it. He believed I was just liking him for who he was, and then it started with his wanting to help me take care of my mother. He told me how I should kill her, and then if I did, to call him, and he would come help me. And from there, I started to change the script and ask him more about himself. He said, my wife died not too long ago, and I pretty much acted like I was surprised. It seemed like I was getting closer to the truth and what he did to Roberta. I want to know what drove you. I want to um, know what drives Phil. I had had enough. Mm -hmm. and were you fighting or it was just like it was it was a pretty good argument the night before yeah but i didn't kill her i kind of, actually i kind of did yeah kind of <laughs> yeah i kind of did yeah the video recorder died like right at that time but i did have the backup audio device going it was very eerie, and you could almost like see it peel off of him, the stress of just carrying it all this time. Say I get ill. Yes. Or they take me to jail. They're not taking me to jail. Say they do. Okay. I want you to get your attorney mm -hmm. to come and marry us. Okay. Okay. Yes. Oh. So you could tell me anything, and then they can't make a spouse testify against no. a spouse. Duh. Would be a marriage of convenience. I have a good attorney down since then. I got my uh, camera. Step up. You're kidding. We entered the restaurant and he was in disbelief that we had a warrant for him. Right up until he got his handcuffs put on, he thought for sure he had uh, he had fooled us. He took him to Bullet, Kentucky, and showed him a dumpster that he claimed to have put Roberta's body in. We tracked down where the landfill was. And we went out there, and uh, we watched a 200,000-pound bulldozer leveling everything. It compresses everything. So she's somewhere in that 500 by 500-foot 500 grid out there anywhere up to 25 feet below the surface. But we just didn't have $15 million that would allow us to bring her back for proper burial. We thought we could come up with more for the family, but that was the end of the line. That was very sad. We said a prayer for her, and, and we left. It's not a happy ending for anybody, but there's bad people in the world. And we need intuitive cops to, to conduct these interviews and to be flexible with, with how they deal with people to bring justice to a case, justice to a family.